Marines and, ser and, serves, and serving in the U.S. Peace Corps as a volunteer on the island of Yap, Micronesia, mm. where she saw firsthand the negative impacts of global greenhouse gas emissions on a small island nation while assisting with the state's first marine protected area. The experience led her to pursue a master's in sustainable development from SIT Graduate Institute and worked in the U.S. on climate mitigation and adaption issues. Stevie holds a Bachelor of Science degree in zoology with a focus on marine biology from Texas A&M University and is certified as an advanced scuba diver. Mm -hmm. I'm impressive. Okay. I need to throw that top on my sentence. I thought you'd be 100. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, um, I, can I can only click it from here, I think. So is it okay to stand? That's perfect. Yeah, I'm just on the Okay, sorry, sorry about the setup, but thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. I don't think I've ever presented to this group, so I always like the opportunity to, you know, just scream at the top of the mountains that the city is doing this work, because I think it's really um, important work, and it's um, a project that I'm personally really passionate about. So um, I was asked to specifically talk about the city's climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan, so I wanted to kind of tell you why we're doing it, um, what scope it is, what it's actually about, and some of the findings, because we're over halfway through it. And so it's really interesting now, because we know city-owned assets that are vulnerable to climate change. And so I'll kind of share with you some of our findings so far, and then how folks can get involved. Um, ultimately, the purpose of the climate adaptation plan is because, obviously, the city has very important public services that we provide. You know, wastewater treatment, water supply planning, um, transportation planning, uh, maintenance of all of our roads, our stormwater. I mean, these are critical systems, obviously, for a city to be um, a good, well-run city. So we, we're kind of taking this whole effort as an approach to be responsible with our, it, making sure we can provide those public services into the future. Because we're looking at these, you know, climate projections, and it's like, wow, we need to be, we make big infrastructure decisions that last, you know, 50 years, uh, bridges when they're upgraded, those types of things are supposed to last a long time, so we need to be considering this climate data into our big city investment and decisions. And ultimately the reason also is just to um, remain resilient, competitive, you know, a well-planned com uh, community, all those things that are tied into being just, you know, well-planned um, and proactive. This whole effort got started back in 2015. Uh, when I f first started, um, a funding opportunity came came in um, our lap a little bit um, at that time, and we're actually using a little sliver of the Deepwater Horizon local um, that will BP oil spill funds to fund some of this, and which is quite ironic. Yeah, I, might, yeah, I think I definitely think it's an appropriate use of the funds. But we did, we're in, some of those funds are being um, used to hire a consultant. The HDR is working with us and guiding us. They have a climatologist on their team, and they have engineers that are kind of helping us look at our system. Um, so we're using some of those funds, and we've been, you know, really just running since then. And last November, um, we presented climate projections and scenarios to the city commission, and they were unanimously adopted and approved for use in the planning process, so I'll kind of go over that. Um, also, just a little bit of background on our policies at a city level that direct staff to do this. This is our city commission strategic plan, and some folks might not know that we have goal number one is kind of a sustainability-related goal, and it has in there as a task to establish a climate adaptation plan and to better understand climate data to integrate into long-range planning, zoning, and administrative decisions. So this this is kind of an internal, you know, wonky docu document, but it's actually really important for city staff because we have to prove in our budgets and we have to prove that we're we have to report on progress that we're meeting city commission priorities that are laid out in the strategic plan. We also have, um, a, our, we rec recently redid, redid our city's comprehensive plan, which is another very important plan, and um, integrated climate language and a whole new climate resiliency goal in our comprehensive plan. So that was also a big milestone. Um, so these are our planning steps here. That's a little um, murky, but I just kind of wanted to show you at a high level what we're doing and, and the four the four check marks is kind of shown what, where we're at, what we've, what we've already done. We're in step five out of six right now. And it all started with us as a team and with the consultants kind of researching 
what climate projections were were out there for the city of Sarasota and getting clarity around it. I think we were a little confused on the offset. There was a lot of science and we didn't know which ones to use and you know um, all the different data that was coming at us. So we did almost kind of a literature review and, and kind of took a stance in time that said we recommend using these climate projections on sea level rise, storm surge, extreme rain events, and heat. So those are the four climate um, impacts that we're looking at. And then we also built an internal city team made up of a lot of technical staff, our city engineer, assistant city engineer, water engineer, stormwater engineer, um, public works director, two city planners. You know, we get together and we identified what municipal systems we wanted to look at where we're vulnerable. So I should also mention, I meant to mention this earlier, what this, what this process is and what it isn't. Um, one, what we're looking at in this process is city-owned infrastructure. And so we want to understand where we're vulnerable to, to our public systems and public services that we provide. But I definitely recognize there more needs to be done. It was, it was hard to draw a scope, and I think this has been a good step for us to, be, to get comfortable talking about climate science. But I know that uh, we get a lot of questions on, well, what about the vulnerabilities to businesses, to neighborhoods, to um, vulnerable populations? I mean, there's other detailed analysis that we need to understand better, but what this whole process is and what I'm talking about is definitely only that kind of hard infrastructure to public services is what we're looking about at and understanding where we're vulnerable. We do plan on doing those other assessments in the, in the near future that I'll talk about at the end, but um, just wanted to clarify that. So we looked at what systems and components of those systems we really wanted to dig in and understand where we're vulnerable. So we looked at eight different areas or sectors in the city. We looked at our stormwater, transportation, wastewater, water supply, shorelines, um, emergency operations, and our parks, uh, parks district and public lands. So maybe that's only seven, but. Um, and ultimately, I'll go into how we did this, but we prioritized, we looked at where we were vulnerable, then we prioritized them and we are developing adaptation strategies now. We'll have public um, input sessions and, ult and ultimately we plan to implement those adaptation strategies so we can respond and upgrade our systems over time or you know, do whatever needs to be done, whether that's abandonment or, or upgrading or whatever choice we have. And one thing we know that there will be big decisions in the future and we wanna you know, help educate folks that, you know, why we're making certain decisions or upgrading certain infrastructures. So that's one reason why I like to get out and present on this um, early on. So I, I always like to, I, I, maybe a lot of you are really, it sounds like you're very active and um, in local issues. So maybe you've already know a lot of this information, but I always like to go over it because we have historical data related to sea level rise, and we also have projected data. And I always like to separate those because our historical data is based on a St. Petersburg tidal gauge. So that's our closest official tidal gauge, that gauge that's been taking readings since 1947. And there is no uncertainty in this data. I mean, this is just a reading from a tidal gauge. There's no modeling. This is just the sea level was here, the sea level was here, you know. Um, so our historical data, there really is no uncertainty, it's just readings. And that has shown our local waters have had a 7.3 inch um, sea level rise since 1947. So I think that's really important. And one aspect to this too is that this local sea level rise data informs our future projections. So we always insert this rate. There's ways you can do this. Um, we, Different areas of the United States have different rates of change based on local conditions. You know, sometimes the, um, if the, the land is subsiding or different ge geographical issues, they have different rates of change. So our sea level rise projections are taken into account local conditions is, is, is what I'm saying and local rates of change. So here's our historical data. We are using the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric um, Administration's projections. And also historical data on extreme rainfall events. I didn't include the graph on here, but in the southeastern United States are showing an increase in those really hard rain events. And we also have had an average mean temperature increase of 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1965. And that's just looking at the temperature gauge right near the airport there in Bradenton. Um, and you can see, you can't really see these graphs too well, but ultimately what they're showing is that we're having more days over 95 degrees and less days under 32 degrees. 
So the mean, the averages of our temperature are kind of shifting over time, and so we're watching that and, and under, trying to understand what that might mean for um, some of our systems. The, so this is where I get into that future projections, and there is uncertainty in here in terms of the scenarios. So it is locally informed by the St. Petersburg tide gauge, it's local rates of change. Um, we usually look around the intermediate high. This uh, coloring looks a lot different on there than it does on here, but that highlighted yellow graph is intermediate high, and you can see, for example, um, in 2050, it's looking at about one, one foot, um, it's 13.32 inches, so one foot, one, you know, one and a half inches almost. So over a foot of change is expected in 2050 compared to 2015 sea levels. So that's, that's significant. And a lot of people ask, and I like to explain, well, there's such a range, you know, in 2050, it's saying anything from 3.6 inches to 21 inches. How does the city plan with such a range? You know, and I think that's a, a good question. And how we think about it is, first of all, that a, some folks might look at that and say, doesn't that show the science is not good and that there's uncertainty there? And I would say that it's not necessarily saying the science is not good. It's based on our emission scenarios and how we're going to respond and what trigger points we're going to we're going to show. So that range of options is actually all the possible outcomes that we could see based on how we respond with our scenarios. So it, it's, um, that's why there's the uncertainty is that, that emission scenarios are, are um, not firmed up yet. And then there's also, um, there's different reasons for the different rises in sea level or the different projections as well. The lowest one is just, is just extending out the historical rate of sea level rise, which we know is already increasing and is you know, not accurate for planning. But that yellow line, the second to the lowest there, takes into account ocean warming, um, but not land-based ice sheet loss. So that's also really a conservative, that NOAA intermediate low is, is not usually um, you know, used very often in a, in a lot of planning. But the intermediate high scenario is, does take into account ocean warming and some land-based ice sheet loss. And the highest scenario is kind of the land, the ocean warming and thermal expansion and the most ice sheet loss um, that scientists could think possible. So um, that's kind of the differences also of, of where they hit. I should mention that these are, these have recently been updated by NOAA and they're actually higher just in 2017. Yeah, they just released new ones and I don't want to confuse folks because I've been using these, but we're actually going to update ours and they, yeah, they are about half a feet, half a foot higher. Um, are ice sheets really breaking up, or are those, is that just fake news? No, they are. <laughs> they definitely are. From everything I'm following, at least, that's not fake news. <laughs> um, We're not going to have Antarctica in pretty soon. Where's the penguins going to go? Yeah, we'll have a, a new place to visit, maybe. Um, so for projections, again, in the future, the ones that the city is using is um, we can expect about three and a half to five and a half degrees Fahrenheit increase by 2050. And what that equates to, because we hover near 95 degrees um, average temperature now, but with that three and a half degree tipping point, it would put us to 50, 60 days total over 95 degrees, which, would, which can be a significant public health um, trigger point, that 95 degrees point. So we're trying to understand that um, a lot better too. There's also some infrastructure components that we're trying to understand too of what that means for our infrastructure. Water temperature um, increases and what that could mean for red tide and, and other issues. Um, five to 10 percent increase in that extreme precipitation, those hard rain events by 2050. And then the higher storm surges, really we're just looking at storm surge because it will be in addition to sea level rise. So the way that the, our models and kind of way of talking about it has been that 2050's category one will look like today's category two. So it will bump up a notch in a sense um, when you take into account. How do the sea level extreme um, precipitation events, how do they affect overall the climate change? Well, so the I know I don't have to wash my car during those times. <laughs> <laughs> so how does the how did how does it get to that point? Is that what you mean? Well, no, I mean, 
how does it does it change the climate over time? Is well, the, cli the the because the global atmosphere is warming. Oh, you're just saying this is an effect. This of is the it. result of it, got right? It, so that it, those okay, more extreme it. rain events are a result of it, and there is a, some data showing that we can expect drier dry seasons and wetter wet seasons. Mm -hmm. So overall, our our rainfall you know, may only increase 5%, but for us, we're considering storm water, especially if we're gonna have those wet or wet seasons, mm -hmm. how are we gonna manage those extreme rain events and what that means um, for us. I would so, think drought would be an issue too with more and more people moving into the area. It's true, and we're definitely, you know, urbanizing with yeah. heat island effects, and mm -hmm. that could just make it worse and how to do better with. And all that cement that's going in, the cons yeah. holds, holds heat. All those new buildings, it holds heat. And it removes natural drainage too. Yep. That's my concern at the 40 in, you know, 41 on Fire Mile Circle yeah. under the where we run the unconditional surrender. Already, you know, because the hospital I work in is uh, apparently where I'm a doctor. I have I heard from the news last week. <laughs> <laughs> Just two blocks there where I uh, work at the with over there. I mean, when you come down there now, it is three feet of water. Yeah, I am in, I'm in touch with the Florida Department of Transportation about that. And they've been, they've been, they're looking in the pipes there to see what the story is. By the end of the week, I should have the answer, the result, what happened. Will you let me know what they say? I'm going to give you my card. Okay. <laughs> All right. I will. <laughs> I called Stubby's office, and Stubby called the Florida Department of Transportation. They sent out cameras to look in the pipes. Well, that, area, that intersection is obviously an evacuation route, so yeah, we're in a priority <laughs> area, and it is identified as vulnerable. So it definitely floods our, as you, and everybody knows who lives here, you know, it floods already. Um, there's a roundabout plans in the future mm -hmm. for that area. So how that's built and what goes into that is kind of part, a huge part of the conversation. I wanted to show these, this, I mentioned all those different sectors that we're considering in this planning process, so public land, stormwater, transportation, wastewater, water supply, water features, which is like ponds and um, different canals, the emergency operations, critical buildings, and shorelines. And then it goes a level deeper. For example, um, for our wastewater system, we're actually looking at the individual infrastructure in that sector. So. We're looking at lift stations and how high off the ground they are. And lift stations receive our you know, raw sewage from our homes and then it pumps it to the wastewater treatment plant, so obviously they're really important. Outfall pipes for our stormwater system, we're trying to understand where they go out to the bay and with sea level rise, you know, how vulnerable each outfall pipe is. Um, you know, really getting detailed into the technical um, side of elevations and locations of different um, assets that the city owns. So we looked at over 220, and this is really wonky. Maybe nobody is interested in this besides me, but we went through this big exercise of giving, asking staff and experts to come in and rate all of those 220 assets vulnerability. And we did that by asking them to rate, to give it a, each asset, like that specific stormwater pipe. What is the sensitivity of it? Which means, you know, how susceptible is it to, the, to climate change impact? And we have sea level rise, precipitation, and storm surge. And we had a rate, rate it one to five. It's highly susceptible being a five. Like this is extremely, this is definitely gonna be impacted in 2050 to low. It's not even gonna be, it's not projected to be impacted. It's way inland or whatever the issue is. Then we also had them give an adaptive capacity score, one to five where we asked for that infrastructure, can it adjust to climate change on its own or with very little cost? Maybe that's a one or two. Maybe that's a um, mangrove area or a place that has mangroves behind it and it can kind of naturally migrate up and it wouldn't be a big cost or infrastructure. But if it would, it'd be a huge cost to upgrade it, um, then that would be a five. Um, so we, we, those two together gave us a vulnerability score. Then we also had everybody come back and give a risk score which was based, that climatologist on the team gave a, a likelihood score, you know, based on all this climate background. And then we had staff and experts do a consequence score. And what we asked them to think about was what would be the impact to our city um, if this was flooded or this was out of commission? What would be the economic impact, the health and safety impact, the cultural and historical impact, and the environmental consequence? 
So we had everybody rank it one to five for each one of those. So it was quite an exercise, you know, and it was trying to take that qualitative values and, and put a number to it, but to help us understand a little bit of the priorities of what we were going to try to dig deeper and um, do something to over time. And essentially, we, um, I'll just go straight to this, essentially we, we mapped out all those numbers. Everything had a vulnerability score and everything had a risk score. All those 220 assets. And if they were highly vulnerable and highly at risk, they were a priority. And they were something that we were going to take through to the next round and um, we're now creating adaptation strategies for to respond. How many of those 220 were? were pushed Both. forward. I think there were 72. That were priority infrastructure? Yes, wow. yeah. Wow. So, and I'll show you some of the results here. Um, this, for example, is the transportation. Yeah. So, um, US 41, of course, from um, 10th, 10th Street to Osprey, that whole section really kind of showed up in different ways. 10th Street Boat Ramp Area, Bayfront Marina, Ringling Boulevard, Pansy Bayou that goes over out towards Moat. Um, there's a little bridge there. Actually, the some Ringling Causeway leading up to the big bridge, it's those low parts leading up to the bridge, um, showed as being vulnerable. Um, MLK had such significant cultural value. There's just, and had some flooding issues. So for all these, um, all these ones that bubbled up in that, that matrix we're looking closer at. And so this was the worst one. <laughs> I mean, worst as in it had the most issues, which might not be a surprise, but it's our stormwater system. And this is an interesting one because the city owns, and this is so impacted and important to our city, but the county maintains our stormwater. So it's kind of a sensitive, um, you know, arrangements where now we're going to meet with the county and say, you know, here are all these issues, you know, how can we work together to make this better? But it's a, it's not like we just own it and maintain it, so we have to work closely with them. Um, so water supply and wastewater both were interesting. When I first got these back, I, I went over to the team and said, are you all not taking this seriously? Like nothing showed up in my box <laughs> up here, you know. And um, really they, they, they explained how because it is a utility, um, there was a lot of redundancy built into our wastewater and water supply systems that are because of, it's very regulated. And so there's a lot of, maybe there's two pipes um, connected to our lift stations, for example. If one gets uh, in an emergency situation, the other one, the other one can, can um, turn on. Lift, lift stations have two generators um, in lots of locations where if one goes off. So they were explaining to me all these um, redundancies that were in place where they didn't necessarily fall into the matrix up here, but we're still considering um, these four the city, there's cer certain city well withdrawal points near the bay that, um, and on the uh, bayou that we are going to still take forward, that we still feel are vulnerable, just they didn't rank the same as other sectors. And there's lift stations that are right on the bay, like I was saying, those, those wastewater um, infrastructure that we're taking forward as well. Um, so these are our public lands, our parks and our shorelines. Obviously, Lido Beach is, you know, huge and vulnerable as any beach uh, will be over time. But we're looking at different seawalls and a lot of our, our parks as well. And parks were considered differently because not only, they're not hard infrastructure in the same way as like a lift station or a stormwater pipe is, but they have so much value to what they will, what they will give us in the future, you know, um, with some of these climate impacts. We hope they have stormwater value, they have, you know, just quality of life value, urban, heat island value, I mean, so much value. So we're, we're actually um, kind of looking at them in a different way than some of the other infrastructure. Um, our emergency operations building, of course, if they're used for an emergency operations, they were chosen for a, usually a reason because they're a resilient building and they are, they're, they're you know, good, but we also looked at all the infrastructure leading to our emergency operations center. <coughs> and so, um, although some of these, kind of like the wastewater, didn't didn't look, um, didn't score the same way, we're still taking some of those forward to do some sort of adaptation measures to make them even more strong. Um, so, so that's kind of the high level of the results, and I'm definitely more than willing to share that. And we have our interim report, which gives all the details and background info on all those those findings. 
but we um, we are planning a public input kind of session and hope to get some interactive feedback on all this. I think it's going to be August 24th. We're looking at August 24th or 29th, but I would love the opportunity to share that date with this group and, and to share to as many people as you would like to, um, to get some good presence at that meeting. And we'll explain this again, a little bit of how we've done it, and then we'll break into small groups and kind of get some input on those adaptation strategies. And if anybody else has ideas on adaptation strategies that we may have missed. And then we plan to have a draft in September. It'll be open for public comment, all that kind of good stuff. And then we plan to integrate these into our capital improvement program over time or, or um, try to find grants or try to, you know, go to the next step of doing what needs to be done to implement it. And then, like I mentioned at the beginning, a very important future phase in the near future, hopefully, is to specifically understand better that private lots, neighborhoods, and integrating those issues into the zoning code and comprehensive plan and, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's my last.